Hi, my name is Nate, owner of Growers House, one of the top suppliers of cultivation equipment in the world. I help growers source equipment and put together some of the largest, most advanced cannabis growing operations. I am constantly looking for the top products and methods needed to grow the best cannabis. Join me on a tour where I get inside access to the industry's leading cannabis grow ops. This, my friends, is Cannacribs. Hey everyone, it's Nate with Canna Cribs, and we're here at the Growers House World Headquarters about to head out to go film episode eight, the season finale of Canna Cribs. Now we're headed out to Wilcox, about an hour drive from the World Headquarters of Growers House to visit the farm, that's with a PH, and Sunday Goods. And their facility is 322,000 square feet, a giant greenhouse. We're gonna go meet up with Short Brooks, one of their top growers over there, and a geneticist in the cannabis industry that is world renowned. He's also known as Gene Finder OG. Let's go visit the farm in Sunday Goods and say hi to Short. So we're here outside of Tucson, Arizona in Wilcox and we're at the farm in Sunday Goods and I'm with Short Brooks, one of the icons of cannabis cultivation and genetics who invited us into this facility he helped build. Welcome. First off, tell us about your background. Like, how how did you even get involved in cannabis cultivation? So I kind of grew up around it since since before I could walk or talk. Always had a good feeling around the plant. Uh, there was I was never warned about any toxicity or to keep away from it. And uh, it's always been part of the fabric of my life, really, mm -hmm. uh, and it remains to be. So. You know, in our conversations earlier, we had some talks about your time in, uh, in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm Dutch originally, but I moved to England for uh, 16 years. I moved back to Amsterdam uh, around the time the Cannabis College was opening. They got me a job as uh, like the Cannabis College gardener. So although I'd been interested in cannabis for a number of years before that, since the, you know, 1990 or so, that was my first daily cannabis growing job and we set up the Flying Dutchman. Yeah, and the so Flying would, Dutchman, for those who don't know, the genetics and seed company. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so we would grow the seeds in the Cannabis College. People would come and see the, see the plants flowering and then they'd get an exact representation of what they would get if they buy the seeds. So we used to grow out cereal seeds, sagamatha, uh, greenhouse seeds, I and mean, all the companies that are around at the time, Flying Dutchman seeds, obviously. And, uh, grow them all out. I mean, the reason that I think you were sought after for this facility and uh, they chose you is because you know more than 99.9% .9 of people out there who even grow cannabis yeah. about what genetics can do what and like which ones, how you can breed for certain environments. Yeah. So like, what is the future of genetics within cannabis right now? I love the fact that we have heirloom vegetables and fruit again now, but it took too long to get there. You know, I love to see that there's craft beers there, but it took however many decades to get that to come back. Right? So you really see this when you get that kind of takeover that it takes a long time for the good stuff to come back. And so I hope that that doesn't happen with cannabis. I would say it's almost naive to think that there isn't gonna be some large money coming into mm -hmm. cannabis and there will be those companies producing you know, we'll call it the, the mass market appeal mm -hmm. cannabis, but the big question is not will that happen? It will happen. Yeah. But the question is, will there still be that craft, the boutique that is allowed to hold on to a certain percentage of the market? I think it's a guarantee just because people love cannabis so much and people have been carrying these genetics through the drug war. I don't think this, it's a different kind of war, but it's still a war and people will probably treat it as such. Um, so as far as the survival of cannabis in its diverse form, it's going to be fine in the right hands. Beautiful. Well, short on that note, I think it's time for us to get started on the tour of this amazing facility. Candy Cribs episode eight, let's get started.
let's go over like your philosophy for genetics because that's the heart that's where everything starts so where do you guys get your genetics from for this facility we had to source genetics from all the best breeders mm -hmm. they were really excited about it because at that time nobody had really grown out 500 pet varieties so yeah uh, if, if a breeder gave us you know 12 varieties we grow them out and they would then come at certain points during the process and help us with the selection process. Wow, that's so, awesome. So yeah. you would grow 500 of one strain, yeah. right? Yeah. And you would just try and maybe tease out the best, mm -hmm. let's say five, 10%, and that's what you would be trying to bring to production, right? The really stable stuff, five, 10%, but generally the first run would be 3%. Ah, and it. then we'd run it from clone three times, uh, preferably in each climate group. So winter, spring, summer, and monsoon, four really to really see which one fitted where, and then we end up on 0.3% usually. And what's nice is if we develop, do any genetic development from those, they're also involved in that process too. So, Got it. Um, you know, we've isolated a lot of stuff, has really good mold resistance, for instance, or just grows really big from clone with uh, not too much leaf, etc., etc. They They can be part of that process for the next generation of seeds. So. You know, that's amazing because right now in the U.S., we're so stymied in academic research. Right. So it has to be done in facilities like this with breeders who are really into their craft. Yeah. This yeah, is yeah, basically yeah. the research and development facility for cannabis in the U.S. right now. Yeah, that's how we'd like to look at it. And we also choose the breeders that we really think epitomize the best of what the industry has to offer. But they're also very different from each other. You know, so we have a lot of hazes from Red Agnes. All the, most of the sours and OGs come from Kama. Mm -hmm. Colorado has a whole bunch of cookie dough stuff that's really good. Uh, Homegrown National Wonders, it's all rotten fruit, mm -hmm. interesting terpenes. You know, it's like they all have something else to offer. And so it keeps it fresh. Mm -hmm. Now, a big part of what I wanted to do here and what we're gearing up to do is research for different cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. you know, when I was breeding, started to breed 20 years ago, a lot of the land races already had a ton of different cannabinoids. THCV was in a lot of the African varieties. There's a lot of CBG, CBN, and a lot of the Afghan stuff. We want to tease that out because a lot of it's kind of been lost the last 30 years of breeding, mm -hmm. um, but it's still there in the old stock. So we want to grow a lot of land races out. Interesting. So at Sunday Goods, you can expect a little bit of these new strains that are, we could say, trendy, popular, faddish, yeah. but then maybe a lot of things that people have heard of but never smoked before yeah. and they're getting the original genetic material that's exactly it so we have some swazi skunk that we're starting we have old jamaican stuff we have old hawaii stuff we have uh, south african nigerian uh, a whole bunch of different stuff that we're starting to grow out so sure this is a giant facility and twenty-five thousand seeds is a huge endeavor um why don't we see exactly how that's done and talk to some people sure we'll talk to jacob next here in front of what looks like almost an endless row of clones. How many clones are actually here? We have right around, I'd say 24,000 clones in this area right now. We have about 500 mothers. We take about 50 clones per mother. We actually have to go in and develop those mothers two to three months before we do decide to cut from them. Tell me a little bit about that. Like what's the process of cutting a clone and what do you use? We use Clonex as our rooting simulator. We use other rooting hormones before, but Clonex has been just by far the best for us. Uh, for operations, it's the easiest to use and most efficient. Yeah. Uh, so we use uh, Clonex, the rooting gel. Then we also use uh, Elite 91 Roots and uh, Micro Jordan. Those are our mycorrhizan fungus and then uh, Vitamin B1. We use those as they are very concentrated. We can use small amounts of those and they're very efficient. They're very easy of use and we can kind of use them throughout the whole process here in our clone. Got it. I guess you dip the clone into the Clonex, and yeah. then you put it in the plug, and does that go in the solution of the Elite 91 roots and mycorrhizae? Um, actually, we pre-soak the plugs in the Elite 91 and the Micro Jordan. We pre-soak in those at, at the same dilution of what will water 
these with the same dilution throughout the next two weeks here. Got it. So that's their plant food, the roots and the Michael Jordan mycorrhizal. Plant. Exactly. The Michael Jordan and the uh, roots is a very concentrated product so that we can just use those and we don't have to use a bunch of other pro products throughout this process. Got it. So for these clones, how long are they in this area, in this bay? Uh, these clones will stay here for two to three weeks, right? right? Depending on our weather and our seasonal variances, sometimes we'll be able to push them out two weeks. Sometimes it'll take up to three weeks. So Jacob, is there anything you guys use to spray on the clones, a straight water or product or anything? Uh, yes, after we do take the clones and put them into their rooting plugs, we do spray them with Clone Guard from Flying Skull. The Clone Guard helps them with their stresses and gives us more success rates. Jacob, I have a pretty good understanding of the propagation area and I saw the veg bay next door. Can we go head over there? Yeah, let's go. I don't always wear protection, but when I do, it's Rayware full spectrum protection. Come with me. So I'm here with Enrique. Enrique, what is your position here at the farm? I'm the cultivation manager here at the farm. Cultivation manager. And you know, Jacob told me on my way over here that you have a little bit more of a traditional ag background. Is that correct? Yes, actually, I've been working in the commercial ag business for about a little bit over 18 years now. Okay, got it. You think a lot of people are going to be making that shift that kind of you were from if, traditional ag to cannabis? If they haven't already, I'm pretty sure a lot of them are thinking about it because I know I was before I came. So. Your guys' veg isn't one area. Can you describe that a little bit for me? Well, actually, it, 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 this is the first six weeks of the area. We have um, three weeks under the, the, the clone domes, mm -hmm. and the trays, and then they go three weeks on the table here. And after they're about six weeks total from there and here, we go another three weeks in our vegging area in the outside over there. In that vegetative section, I noticed there were those giant drain tubs, which is not something that I'm familiar with. Can you speak to that? Yeah, those are actually from Formflex. Uh, they come out with their specialized machine. They bring it into the greenhouse. They put their sheet metal on a roller and it goes through their mold and they lay the, the entire length of the actual gutter from, from end to end. And you can recapture your drainage through that their gutter system. Yeah, so you take the water that you fed the plants already. It's not going to waste. You're saying you're collecting it maybe trying to bring it back into the garden exactly you can do that you can recycle it if you have a, a way to recycle the water right? you have to disinfect it first usually through a, a vilex machine or yeah i know it's a big process but it's really important for the cannabis industry to have these sustainable practices because these are energy intensive plants and whether that comes from wattage energy and lights or the amount of water that's used to actually keep these plants going i mean it's very very intensive yeah, I mean, you can have a cost savings of anywhere 25 to 30 percent depending on how much you you drain you know how much you actually drain with Formflex, we also avoid having standing water around so that helps us with our pest and disease as well how how'd you guys get into using just perlite because this is the first cannabis facility i've been to where they're just using perlite we can have anywhere from 30 to 40 different strains per valve section and they all take a different amount of water so mm -hmm. What the perlite does for us helps us avoid having wet feet and roots. We like to use those because of the sustainability, right? We can uh, sterilize them and use them an infinite amount of times. We know of a grower in Holland that's been using them for over 20 years. So it's the same bucket of media? The same bucket of media, it just has to go through a sterilization. What do you guys do for pests and disease here? I mean, for your IPM regimen, what are you guys using primarily? We actually use Copert for our IPDM. We have a program with them where we receive weekly beneficials. Got it. And for, by beneficials, you mean beneficial insects? Beneficial that are... insects that they, yeah. they eat the bat pests. Well, they, they, they really know what, what they're doing. They know what pest is attacked by what beneficial and we're very in tune. They come and visit us. They actually provide us with a bug air gun that we use to help ex, uh, actually spread out the beneficials a lot quicker than That's... we would if we were doing them by hand. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, doing it by hand, you get the little you get the little thing and you throw it out in your garden, but this one, it's like, you just shoot them out yeah, everywhere? you shoot them out, it's, 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 it's faster, right? You save money on labor costs because it's just, it's quicker to get them out. We also use sachets that we introduce in, in the uh, flower area. It's more of the material they use to carry the bugs on that you don't want yeah. to have on your flowers. I know what you're talking about. It's like that 
hay sawdust yeah kind it's of like stuff. the sawdust so you want to keep that enclosed in a little sachet to avoid that falling on your flower enrique since you're using beneficial insects here do you guys try and keep yourselves from spraying anything else we try not to spray but there's times when we have to and in one case we use trifecta to help with preventative measures actually john the owner's here oh he is yeah. okay well yeah maybe we can chat with him i can go get him for you, you okay like. thank you enrique right. no problem man mm -hmm. john enrique told me that you're here to help them consult on best practices of using it can you help us go through on like how someone would best use your product nate the whole thing starts with where you're at regionally like what i saw here i could not believe the fact that I'm going to a desert, you know, and these conditions are crazy. I never thought that somebody was going to be able to put something together like this. They've done an unbelievable job. You look at the canopy of this bedroom and it's dead on. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, so starting with where you're at really has a lot to do with how you run through an IPM management strategy. So in a, in a facility like this, we find most of the time veg is when we're doing all of our sales in the trifecta crop mm -hmm. control. We'll run it to a healthy plant once a week application. And then as soon as they're gonna flip all of this into flower, they move into more biocontrols. So all of your predatory mites. Uh, and you wanna try, nobody wants to spray anything. Nobody wants to spray stuff in flower. You know, we want that clean organic stuff and that's what they're doing here. Yeah, so on an outdoor environment where you don't have these type of environmental controls of temperature, humidity, keeping some pests out, um, what's the application? It's a little bit different, you're saying? It's a little bit different. Our product is broken down in 72 hours. So there's no seen residuals after that. Now, all of the essential oils that are in Mayan, your uh, geraniols, your clove, your thyme, all of the garlic, it takes a couple more days to gas off completely. In an outdoor application, people are using my product through flour. We tell everybody to stop at two weeks before harvest. Got it. Okay, that gives enough time for all the residuals to be broken down, everything to gas off. Uh, I've had people use it up further, but we don't recommend it. What does it protect for? <laughs> so it's called trifecta. Yeah. Because it goes after mold, mildew, pests. Got it. Okay. okay. So in a situation like this, once again, they're going to be running this at one ounce per gallon once a week. Primarily, you're going to do it every Monday, say. If you can get into electrostatic nozzles, you're going to save a tremendous amount on overspray. Uh, you're going to get a better, fuller coverage with the plant. Usually you're going to run something at about two to four cents a plant per month. So it is very economical. Like this industry is so much fun. Oh, it, it totally is. It is so much fun. Mm -hmm. And more and more people are using it because more and more people are getting conscious about what they're putting on their plants. Mm -hmm. You know, you want that organic, you want that, you know, biodegradable stuff. You want as, as clean as possible. Mm -hmm. And it was just great timing and the product itself is phenomenal. Uh, and, and people are just receiving it with open arms. Right now, we just put out the RTU. So that's a ready to use product for all of your smaller indoor gardens and, and your hobbyists. Uh, we also released our Boost product, which is a wetting agent used for foliar feed application. Uh, also came out with a new product for cleaning out the hydroponic lines. And it's got a really neat name. It's called Wook Wash. Wook Wash. So if you have nice. those Wooks, you know you got to wash them down. Oh, and everybody with a large hydroponic system has got the Wooks. Any, <laughs> anybody that's been around the cannabis industry knows what a Wook is. Mm -hmm. Got to keep it clean. Thank you for the deep dive about Trifecta and IPM. These plants using Trifecta look amazing. So I'm going to let you get back to working with Enrique on the consulting. I'm going to hop over to the flower bay. This was a great experience. Thank you, Canna Cribs, for everything. The t-shirts are great. Hashtag fuck mice. Give a big shout out to Andrew out here on this t-shirt. Uh, you guys have done a great job educating people. Everybody should know by now that the farm and Sunday Goods are putting out that fire, that clean, healthy fire herb right now. And it has been a pleasure having you guys over here. John? Thanks, brother. I'm here in the flowering area with Tony. And Tony, what's your role here at the facility? I'm the director of agricultural operations for the farm. The summer months in, in this Arizona region, not a lot of people know, but monsoons, basically in the dead heat of summer, then it starts raining a lot, the humidity spikes, and you're dealing with high temperature and high humidity. 
How do you deal with that in a facility like this? One thing is, is we're in Wilcox for a reason. And the reason is because it's, it's high in altitude. We're at 4,200 or so uh, feet in altitude, which provides a little bit cooler climate than you would find in Phoenix or Tucson. And that also helps us be able to deal with uh, the Arizona heat. Uh, we have what we call a pad and fan cooled greenhouse. So on the back back there, we have a wet wall that we pull air through. Our fans are on the walkway here. So we're drawing air across the plant. Right now it's not running because we actually have kind of a nice cool day, unusual for this time of year. And we'll pull air through the pad. It'll cool because it's so dry outside and then it'll be exhausted out the greenhouse. And that's how we cool the, cool the crop. Yeah, I noticed it's like on either side, it comes in, goes over the crops, and in the middle, you almost have this chimney-like giant fans that push it out. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly how it works. The plants here look extremely healthy, and I know that the IPM strategy in vegetative growth phase can be very different than from the flowering phase. Can we go over your guys' IPM strategy here at the farm for flower? We have a whole team of a, uh, a staff of eight people that uh, are assigned different areas to scout, plus our, our what we call our bay owners, our workers that are assigned one bay, they also scout the plant. And then our IPM program and our team uh, starts taking over from there. The plants are marked. Uh, we have a program where we're applying certain uh, products, beneficial fungicides, particularly in early veg stage and also in early flower. Some of those products that we use are uh, from uh, Marone Bio. We use Regalia. That's mostly for botrytis and mildew. Uh, we also use Venerate and um, Grandivo. Uh, those are mostly to combat aphids or thrip. They're uh, beneficial insecticides. Uh, they're very safe products. They do not come out in the test. They're, they're OMRI listed. And they also work very well with our bio program, our IPDM program, where we, uh, where we put in uh, the mites and stuff from sachets from Coppert and BioBest. They're very gentle. Um, they don't, like I say, they don't change the terpene profiles. They don't affect the um, the flower itself and like I say we try and do them mostly in early stages uh, to control early and then allow our IPDM uh, program to finish out the crop at the end. Uh, apart from the products we use from Marone, um, we use uh, some products from uh, Sierra Natural Sciences. Everything that we use is OMRI listed, number one. That's, that's number one on our list. It has to be OMRI listed. We're here to produce A quality flower. We're not here to try and produce extract. And so, you know, not changing the terpene profiles, not changing how the quality of the flower, trying to protect that in the last three, four weeks is very important to us. Beautiful. And so for products like that, how do you, how do you distribute it? Do you have sprayers that come from the ceiling on down? Or no, how does what that we work? have is we have, uh, obviously we have a big greenhouse and we have a lot of area to cover. Uh, the spray machines that we use um, are Holland Green Machine spray machines. They're automated. So yeah, we just call nice. them the spray bots, you know, we, yeah. we put them out, they program them. Uh, so they work very well for us. Tony, thank you so much for showing me this flowering process. Now I think it's time for me to head to trimming. Sounds good. Just doing a little bit of light reading in between filming Canna Crips takes. Checking out cannabis and tech today. Actually, read more about Canna Crips and pick up one today. Or go to canandtechtoday.com. You can read more. Thanks for reading. So Cliff, I was brought in here and told to meet up with you, and what's your role here at the facility? Yeah, so I'm general manager here at the farm. Wow, okay, so general manager of everything. Correct. Okay, but um, right now I know we're in the trimming room, which is a very busy place. It is. Uh huh. So how many people are uh, active in your trimming process? So in this whole process we have about 50 individuals. Wow, so that's like yeah. a quarter of your staff. All dedicated trimming. The bulk of our flower we trim by hand. We want to give it that touch. We use the Harvest More trim bins. They're a great tool for us. Ergonomically designed, made specifically for the cannabis industry. They're awesome. Mm -hmm. Have the micron screen so we're able to capture the keef through the hand trimming process. Got so it. a great tool for us. Yeah, awesome. So Cliff, do you guys only trim by hand at this facility? No, actually we also do machine trimming. Oh, you guys do, okay. We do. So what do you guys use for the machine trimming? So we use the Centurion Pro 
the Gladiator model. Yeah. It's an amazing piece of machinery. It's a wet and dry trimmer. It's mm -hmm. pretty amazing. It's like having two machines in one because this is a double cannon design. Mm -hmm. And those cylinders, they're quantanium coating. Mm -hmm. So it's a non-stick type, type coating, so it's easy for cleaning. Yeah. Uh, so it's just an amazing tool for efficiency. Okay. So I mean like how much of your product goes through you know the centurion, would you say? So our tier one product is all done by hand. Tier two is done with the machines. Mm -hmm. So it's seasonal. Got it. Okay. And I mean, are you guys trimming a lot faster with, you know, something like that, an automated oh, trimmer? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very efficient. Uh-huh. Well, I see this cannabis. It's making its way into these buckets, which I think the next logical step is curing. So it's time for me to head out. Let's go meet the cure master OG himself. So I heard this is your domain. So why don't we go over your name, your title, and where we're at? Um, Charles Crum. Uh, we're in the cure room right now. My title is RPM Supervisor, AKA Cure Master OG. I like it, Cure Master OG, huh? Yep. So Charles, you have so many different strains here. How exactly do you manage cure time? Like you can't just uniformly cure them the same. Some will be good, some will be bad. How do you deal with that? Uh, we base it off strain. A lot of it's in here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we do log a lot of it on a database, mm -hmm. and depending on the strain and the moisture content, we can alter the climate depending on that okay. to, to match each strain Got it. to get the optimal cure time. So I can tell this room is temperature and humidity controlled. What are you guys doing? Is it just normal HVAC system, something special? Uh, we got a HVAC system, we got Aeons, and we also have a built-in Carol Humasonic humidification system. And that really allows us to dial it in especially on certain strains. Interesting, so you're saying dial it in. I know most people with their curing rooms, they say, okay, 60 degrees, 60% humidity, yeah, it yeah. stays there forever. Yeah. You're saying yours doesn't. It can, it can, but once you're really trying to dial it in, then you can play with it and potentially bring out different flavors. I'm getting, I'm getting the impression, Charles, that you're, you take this very passionately. Just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah pretty passionately. Uh huh. So we were talking earlier and you were talking about getting that funk that gas. The gas, the funk, yeah, the cheese, yeah. all the different flavors. Yeah. So that's yeah. always your goal when yeah. a strain comes in here. It's, it's not about pushing it out, it's about having, when they crack that bag, having that gas, that fire, so. Hmm, so what is the Charles method? Let's say a dense strain comes in here, like uh, give me a good example of a strain here that's dense, that's gassy. Headbanger, Sour Power. Yeah? Yeah, Las Vegas, those mm -hmm. are all pretty gassy. Okay. Danky and dense too. So what do you do for curing those strains specifically? We have to burp them a lot more because they're off-gassing a lot more because of more moisture. But potentially we'll burp maybe double than we will a different strain, but at different time periods. We might do a 10 minute, 15 minute, crank the temp up, get it hot, let it sweat, and burp it again. Just pay extra attention. So Charles, how do you know like when a strain, like let's say Sour Power OG, is like, okay, this is perfect, it's ready, let's take it to packaging. Look, what do you do with it? Is it a touch, a feel, are it's you testing a, it? It's a touch, feel, smell, mm -hmm. but more or less, it's, it's you smell it. You know it's ready. Mm -hmm. you, you can go three weeks and it's okay. You go that extra, the extra week and it's just killer. Well, Charles, Mr. Cure Master OG, thank you for showing me your domain. It was it's, nice uh, to meet you, brother. Yeah, it's time for me to go check out the packaging room where you tag him back. All right, have a good time, man. Take care. The packaging room, this is where you finally tag everything before it goes out the door. So what kind of products are you guys creating and packaging right here? Okay, so we have our bulk packaging. Mm -hmm. We do one pound bags. Mm -hmm. We also offer pre-rolls. Okay, we also have our rosemary lemon pastels, which are like a hard candy, chocolates, in a couple of different flavors. So we have milk chocolate, we have dark chocolate, but it also has peppermint in it, um, crushed pretzels, and then there's some seasonal flavors also depending on the time of year. Vape pins, of course, that's something big on the market right now. So we also make bath bombs here. They're, you can get them in CBD or THC or both. So Cliff, 
Those are all the products that Sunday Goods makes. Actually, we have another one. Intimacy Spray. Intimacy Spray. What's the closest store that you guys sell at? <laughs> Beautiful. Well, Cliff, I saw that you guys have what looks like a bud sorter over there. So the product must come in those black buckets from Cure. Correct. To the bud sorter. Can you explain that a little bit? So for sizing our flower, we use the Easy Trim Bud Sorter. It's a great table to use because it's separating out your trim and shake. So we're getting that out of the bag and then we're sorting it into the popcorn size and the large size. What's also really cool about it is because you get to see your flower as you're processing it. And so you're able to really dial in and take out anything that you may not want it for bag appeal. Got it. I mean, using a, you know, a bud sorter like that, it's probably way easier than the old school method of clipping it, looking at it, right? I mean, that probably took you a lot longer than. Oh, absolutely. Now yeah. this is very efficient and we really get a good look at the whole array of flour that's on the table. Our Cure Master OG, he's working so diligently to dial in that flavor, that funk, that gas. We don't want to lose it. So we use the Integra Boost humidity packs in the bags because they're food grade safe and they don't affect flavor. Mm, yeah, that flavor and those terpenes. I mean, the last thing you want is to cure a perfect product, yeah. put it out to go to market, and then some of it's lost. So exactly. you guys are using the Integra as almost like, uh, I guess you could say an insurance policy Absolutely. to keep your flour at top tier A grade. Correct. Cliff, I noticed that behind me, they're filling up the raw cones for the uh, STM Canna Rocket Box. I was just playing around with one of those at the last can of crib set. Did you guys just get that here? Yes, we did. We love it. It's a great combination with our raw cones. The efficiency is just amazing. The fact we can do 450 pre-rolls in a very short period of time gives us that ability to do thousands of pre-rolls a day. Yeah, I actually like that raw started making cones for the industry because a lot of the other stuff out there was like bleached papers and things like that. And I just kind of like the hemp derived non bleached things for me personally. They have the best smokeability. Absolutely, they're great. Cliff, thank you so much again for letting us yeah. into your facility. It's been a pleasure. The pleasure's been ours. Can of Cribs episode eight at the farm and Sunday Goods. That's a wrap. Now I'm about to go hang out with my crew in my hometown. Thank you for watching.